So as Tim said earlier, we're finishing our series uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, we'll get into the Christmas passages tonight, but we're finishing our series in the book of Acts this morning. We were covering Acts 8 to 12. Uh, that was the second, you know, we did 1 through 7 a couple years ago. We're doing 8 to 12, which really focused on the persecution of the early church. Uh, and, and in this persecution, we saw God's power continue to be displayed, and we, and we were encouraged by that. And then we were challenged by the fact that the church continued to press harder even though they were being persecuted. And we need to be encouraged, and we need to be challenged, because if you sit here today, if your faith is in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the same call on your life as they did in the first century, and that is to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. You have that call today. I say that boldly because it's easy for us to forget, is it not? Is it not? It is. And so I pray you've, you've felt that encouragement, and you have felt that challenge. Now, as we get into the last chapter today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through the passage fully. We're going to walk through it, explain a few things, and then we're going to see what I believe God wants us to pull out today, that we may continue to be encouraged and continue to be challenged. Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending that after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made for him. Was made for him, well, no, earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Verse 6. Now when Herod was, out, was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up, saying, get up quickly, and the chain fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals, and he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought that he was seeing a vision. Now when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street. And immediately the angel left him. Now when Peter came to himself, he said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the, that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, uh, the same Mark that we believe wrote uh, the book of Mark, side note, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Now, recognizing Peter's voice and her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and the brothers. And then he departed and went to another place. Now, when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod had searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. That was the crime that day. If you let somebody go under your watch, you suffered the same punishment they were going to suffer. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Verse 20. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, which is an awesome name, by the way, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. And on an appointed day, Herod put up his royal robes. <clears throat> he took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, this is the voice of God and not a man. And immediately... An angel of the Lord struck him down, 
because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms, and he breathed his last breath. Finally, in verse 24, it says, but the word of God increased and multiplied. This is the word of the Lord. All right, so chapter 12 starts with Herod, the ruler of the Jews. This is the grandson of the other Herod that murdered the babies trying to kill Jesus. Obviously, he didn't fall far from the tree. So he started to persecute the church, which means he killed James. Now, this isn't James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James. This was James that was one of the sons of Zebedee. You might, if you know the Bible, you remember in Mark 3, where they, you know, kind of fun, you know, in a fun way, nicknamed themselves the sons of thunder. This is one of them who was murdered. And when Herod saw, like, oh man, the people like that I murdered James, they're like, okay, let, go get me Peter. He's even a bigger name because he wanted to boost his popularity. So we have Peter awaiting trial and, and, and death here. And so then it, the night before this is all going to go down, the angel appears out of nowhere and he gives him a jolt, you know, you know, get up. And they go outside the gates, the angel goes away, and Peter like realizes what happens. And then he goes to where many other are praying for him. And I think this is what ensues, one of the funniest passages in Scripture. He knocks on the door as we read, and Rhoda answers it, recognizes his voice, and she runs back to tell everybody, minor details, she forgets to open the door for Peter. You know, I can just imagine him knocking like, Rhoda, Rhoda, you know, Rhoda. Now, no one believes her, which I think is kind of ironic because they're probably literally sitting there praying for Peter. They would know that tomorrow he's going to get the ax. And yet they're like in doubt, which is kind of ironic. Instead, they said, no, no, this can't be Peter. It must be his angel. Now, what they're probably referring to here is the idea of guardian angels. In Jewish thought, every person had a guardian angel. And, and some, they thought these guardian angels could actually take the form of your body. This is in the Bible. It just, was just in Jewish tradition. And we've all grown up hearing about guardian angels. You know, you may have wondered that. You know, do I have a guardian angel? If I have one, I want mine fired. He failed this past week. <laughs> Incredible job. <laughs> Long story short, the Bible does not ever make it clear that every single person or every single believer in Christ has a guardian angel that is protecting them at all times. Okay, So I don't think it's something that we should ever fonder, we should ever promote, we should ever focus on. Uh, because in the end, if you think about it, if we have a, an omniscient, all-powerful, all-seeing, loving God with us, like, does it really matter if he has a finite guardian angel protecting us? And like, second, even if we did, I'm not sure God would want to focus on that. I think throughout Scripture, it's very clear that God, is, God always wants us looking to Him in all situations. Us as humanity, we can be so distracted looking to angels uh, or, or men as our source of hope and, and comfort that it keeps our eyes from looking and pouring out our hearts in prayer and dependence to God. He is where our focus needs to be. He is the one that we should always be seeking. And he is the one that in whatever way he chooses, whenever he chooses, is the one who will provide for us. Amen, church? I remember, do you remember in the early 90s where angels were all aglow? I mean, you had angels everything. Remember, you know, grandmother would have angels everywhere in the house, angel pillows, you know, angel porcelain dishes, like angel everything was everywhere. It's fun to talk about such things, but our focus should be on the Lord. All right, go to 16 to 25. Now, everyone celebrates Peter's return. And then the chapter flips again back to Herod. And he's kind of a common, common theme through all of this. And people were coming to pay homage to Herod because they were hungry. They were out of food. So they're like, hey, dude, we'll say whatever you want. Just feed us. And Herod, loving the glory, sits down on his royal throne to hear all of this. And, and the historian Josephus, he says that his, his robes were made of silver. So they sparkled in the sunlight. And so he was sitting there, and they were shouting to him, this is the voice of God and not a man. And an angel struck him down. He didn't stop him. He just took it in. And it says that he was eaten by worms in verse 23, 
and he breathes his last breath. Now, this can give you an image of him like falling over and you know, horrible, you know, like a horror movie, worms coming out of every part of him. But according to, once again to Josephus, he, he tells us that Herod actually lingered in, in pain for five, five days. That he had some probably some kind of tapeworm that was eating inside of him, killing him. And so it, it's, a, it's interesting that among all his pomp and his majesty, his beautiful robes, that he, he actually ended up dying a pretty gross and shameful death. So what do we take away from all of this passage that literally has nothing to do with Christmas? Now, anytime you come to the Bible, the only way for you to ever properly pull out any truth that God has in there is for you to understand the context in which the writer was writing the passage. Like, you have to understand, this is why Luke, who wrote Luke, who acts, this is why he was writing it to him. That's the only way you can ever pull out anything for you. And so what's Luke's intention in writing this? I think his intent was to highlight what happened here and how God worked because he wanted to encourage the early church. Remember, they were going through all kinds of suffering in the early church. Murdered, persecution, we've been following the last five chapters. And and you know this. Now, we don't know anything about persecution in in, in the American church. We know nothing like what they know. But we know how easily things can go wrong in our lives and we feel like, like, God, what are you doing? Like, I literally busted up my ankle, and this week I'm like, woe is me eeyore in it. In fact, Jobin, he came and visited me in the, in the uh, urgent care, and he goes, I once knew this pastor in India. Both of his kidneys were failing. They kept thinking he was going to die. He was yellow and looked frail. But you know what? Every day he would go out and minister to the people. Every week they'd say, he's going to die. But no, he wouldn't die. He'd keep preaching, and he'd keep preaching. He'd go and minister to those that were sick. You know, well, okay, Joe, what's the, Maria and I are sitting there, we're like, what's the point? He goes, he goes, no matter what kind of pain you're in, just remember, you got two working kidneys. <laughs> Believe it or not, that has been my call to battle as I've fallen over many times this week and suffered with many other things. But he's saying to these people, like, you may feel overpowered. You may feel weak. And we've all felt that way, even if it's not from persecution. He said, you may be seeing some of your Best leaders murdered on a political whim. But he goes, that's not the truth of the world. He goes, that's not the way that it really is. And I think all Christians throughout history have been tempted to feel that way. I mean, through the universe, there's been a war that has raged on every front. It began with the angelic Lucifer, who we know as Satan, When he rebelled against God, he was cast like lightning from heaven. And from that moment on, there has been a war rage between Satan and God that has engulfed angels and it has engulfed men. On the human front, it began with Adam and Eve when they rebelled against God in Eden, when they ate the forbidden fruit. And throughout century after century, men have shaken their fist in defiance at God. I don't need you. I don't want to follow you. I don't want to believe in you. I am going to live my own life. And just like in biblical times today, we see people who want to battle God. Many of them were kings, and uh, they're kings or they're rulers who believed after years of immense power for themselves that they could oppose God. In reality, the prophet Isaiah says this. He says that kingdoms of man are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. He said, God, behold, God lifts up the islands like fine dust. All of the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. And I think this is a good reminder because we as Christians can be tempted to see everything going on politically or in our schools or in our culture and and, in politics, and we can get filled with anxiety and we can get filled with fear. We can almost come off a little bit paranoid. I've seen some of your Facebook feeds, right? We can come off like, it can almost come off like 
We don't really believe in the God that we proclaim to sing about. And some of you sitting here who might not even believe in God or you're still trying to figure out if he's real, you see Christians and you see them act in this paranoid, fearful, anxiety-filled you know, uh, anxiety way and you're like, it does not match up with what you say about God. And you are absolutely right. It does not match up. No Christian should ever be paranoid. No Christian should ever be filled with fear that when they go around and they're talking, and when they're talking about politics or schools, that fear is the forefront of everything that they say. No Christian should ever be filled with anxiety at the world around them as if there is no hope. We either choose as Christians to believe that Scripture says God is in control or we look at everything that this says he's out of, it's out of control. We have to choose which one we're going to believe. And far too many Christians look and sound like they believe this more than they believe that he is in control. But you see him exercise his control right here. First, he sends an angel to release Herod's prized prisoner, the one that's going to bump up his stock that would bring him more glory and honor. Then we see God use an angel to strike him down in a painful and humiliating death. He was sitting there on the throne wanting to be worshipped like a god, and he ended up dying like a sick dog. It reminds me of when we studied Daniel years ago where Daniel said that God changes times and seasons. He is the one who removes kings and allows kings to be set up. It is a good reminder this morning that no king, no enemy can succeed in hindering the kingdom of Jesus. We saw this in verse 24. Luke sums all of this up by saying, the word of God increased and it multiplied. We have seen through all of these five chapters that no matter what is brought against the gospel, it continues to spread. The North African Christian writer and apologist, Tertullian, is alive in the first, second, third century, somewhere in there. He said he addressed the rulers of the Roman Empire, and he said, look, you can kill us, you can torture us, you can condemn us, you can grind us to dust, but the more that you mow us down, the more that we grow. For the seed of the gospel is the blood of Christians. This goes along with what Paul used to write when he was in prison in Philippians. He goes, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me as he sits in prison has really served to advance the gospel. And if you look at the history of Christianity, if you read it, you'll see how persecution of believers promoted the gospel. In the Roman Empire, it was Nero. He's the one who began to tyrannize the church. And then Diocletian, it got way worse under him. But what happens today? You go to Rome, what do you find? You find remains of the Roman Empire. You find a, a viaduct here, which is really cool to see. You find a column here. You find Roman roads that were built really well because they're still there. But the, the Roman Empire is gone. But what about the Church of Jesus Christ? It is alive and it is well all over the world. It's alive and it's well right here. Jesus said in Matthew 16 that the gates of hell will not, prevent against, not prevail against his church. So much of the gospel and the spread of it has come through suffering, which goes completely against our Western culture, God loves us. He's going to bless us. He's going to make everything good for us. Everything is sparkles and rainbows and sunshines and little, little kittens. That is not the history of the gospel. It is through suffering. And I think one of the reasons that it's through suffering is because suffering, when a Christian responds in the right way to suffering, it makes him stand out to everybody else around him or her. Tim Keller said, if you want people to see this suffering Savior who died for you, how is that ever going to be possible if everything goes well for you? I think the reality of Christ is, most, is, is best displayed in our lives, the most clearly displayed, when things do not go well. And, and, and when we don't have all the things that the world has to offer. 
think that too often the world sees this brand of Christianity where we have like regular lives like everybody else. We act and respond like everybody else, but we tack church on Sundays. And they see that and they're like, this doesn't make this obviously it's meaningless. But when we're persecuted, when people oppose us in our faith, but we stand with our heads high with love, not hate in our hearts, proclaiming the gospel, then that actually says something. How can people act like this when they're treated like that? They're being penalized for this, and yet they stick to it. I've told you this before. I mean, how many times in our lives have you been in situations where you tell people you're a Christian, you don't hide it, and people might make fun of you for it or make sarcastic remarks about it? or completely ignore you altogether. But when something's going really bad in their lives and they got nowhere else to turn to, they have exhausted every resource, they'll come and say, hey, can you pray for me? The opposition we face as Christians, it's an opportunity to show how Christ is different. And I wonder where in your life, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your school for you high schoolers, Maybe it's what your family, what you're all about to spend some time with, where the opposition and what you're coming up against is going to give you an opportunity to show the difference that Christ makes. So Christians here, be encouraged. Do not be impressed by the worldly triumphs that happen from time to time. Be bold and courageous with the gospel. Keep sharing the good news. Keep planting seeds, no matter what the cost. Now, I also like to give this caveat anytime I say this, because there's some of you who will never share the gospel at all out of fear, and there's others that you want to go beat people over the head with gospel. Tonight, your Uncle Fred will be unwrapping his present, and you'll grab him right after he says, let me show, Uncle, do you want to know how to unwrap Jesus in your life? Yeah. Right? Okay, It is important because sometimes the persecution we face as Christians is just because of the way we're acting. It's not the gospel. We're just, we're a pain to be around. And so it's so important for those of you who are hesitant to go tell people about Jesus, say, God, give me the courage. Give me the courage. Give me the words. Help me step out in faith. And for those of you who love to share the gospel, it is your job to say, Holy Spirit, help me to know when and how to speak into somebody's life. Let me be dependent on your promptings for the right moment to plant a seed. Amen, church? Now, lastly, this doesn't mean like we shouldn't care when we see the church struggling. Like we see people suffering and we're like, you know what? God's got this. Let's go Netflix and chill, right? That's not, I don't want to say that. We need to be engaged. We need to care. We are Far too apathetic. And one of the ways that, one of the ways that we do that, the, one of the ways that they highlight here, the one I want to touch on, is found in Acts 12.5. It says, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made to God by the church. Earnest prayer. Now, why would Luke include this in there? He could have did the whole story about Peter getting freed out of prison, you know, by an angel. Could do all that. Did not need to include this, but he chose to include it. We need to pay attention to that. I think Luke wants to show us the cause and effect relationship between prayer and God's movement. Prayer and Peter being released. We need to be reminded, prayer actually makes a difference. Scripture says this. Now, we struggle to remember this because we don't always see prayer looking. In fact, one of like my biggest fears, which I know I probably won't have any fears in heaven, but I'm like, just one of the things that just kind of blows my mind that when I get to heaven, if like God has a chart or I don't know, a chart or maybe has like a, a video or something, you know, and it explained how prayer worked like fully because we don't understand how it fully works, that my mind will just be blown about the difference that it's made. It's one of those times that even when we don't see it making a difference, we have to choose. Are we going to choose our eyes and the difference that we don't see, or are we going to trust in God and his word that prayer makes a difference? <coughs> they trusted in God. The early church had no political clout. None. Didn't come yet. 
They had no one in the high places like pull strings for them. They, they literally, all they had was to go to the highest throne of all and seek God's help. And that's what they did. They prayed for Peter. They prayed. It reminds me of what James says. James, the brother of Jesus, he says that the, the effective prayer of a righteous person can accomplish much. Now, one thing I want to talk about that we don't talk about much is there are still Christians today across this world that are in prison for their faith. They're right now in prison for their faith. We as Christians, they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should be praying for them. I mean, when's the last time you remember praying for somebody who was imprisoned for their faith? I was sitting here this morning, I couldn't remember. Hebrews 13, 3 says, Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you are also in the body. In other words, like pray for them as you would want people to pray for you if you were in prison for your faith. We ought to pray for them that God would give them the grace to bear with the suffering, that they may be a triumphal witness for the Lord, especially the Christians today. They're not going to their family tonight. They're not going to see them tomorrow. There's no presence. They don't even know if they're going to be kept alive. We should ask the Holy Spirit to minister to them the word of God to, to bring to their remembrance the things that they have read, that they may be encouraged. I think... <clears throat> When you come across the articles or, or newscasts and you hear about Christians being imprisoned, it, like it's, man, it's so easy. We get so numb to all of it. Like even me, I'm like a pastor and I'll be like, that's so sad. And then like I'll go back to eating my Cheez-Its. Like I'm watching the news. I'm like, where, where and how did I become so callous to my brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering in this world? It's my prayer that every time you come across that, I come across the story of someone who's in prison for their face or, or you get a, you know, a copy of Voice of the Martyrs in the mail that you know, talks about all this or wherever it comes from, that you'll literally stop wherever you are and you'll pray for them from now until eternity. And you have no idea how you could become a part of someone else's story. I don't know how this works in heaven, but I, like, I think it would be awesome if it did work this way, that that you're in the gates of heaven one day and you find someone come up to you who says, thank you for your prayers. And you learn about how your prayers made a difference in their freedom. Look, like I said, we have a choice. Either we're going to believe what our eyes can see and pray like that, or we're going to say, when God says, look, prayer makes a difference, we're going to believe him and we're going to pray like that. Where's your faith at? In what you can see or what God says? You have to make a choice. F.B. Meyer said that the great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but it's unoffered prayer. And it can be so tempting to, to give up pray, on praying on things. Like even take it out of, um, you know, people like suffering for their faith, just people you're praying to come to faith or people you're praying for healing. Like you just sometimes you can pray and you can pray and you feel like you've prayed a lot, and probably most of the time you haven't prayed as much as you feel like you have, but you feel like it, and you get this feeling inside of you where you just feel like, man, this is never going to happen. You ever felt that way in praying? Like, it's just, this isn't going to happen. Like, you would never say it out loud, but it's a voice in your head. We have a choice in those moments to let those prayers sit in, take root in our, I mean, those thoughts take root in our heart, or we can get rid of them as quickly as they come in. Because literally what it means, and we don't think about this, at least I don't when I struggle with those temptations, is if you are ever carrying away with that temptation that, man, God's probably not going to do this. What you're actually saying is that whatever this situation is, it is too far gone for God to act. Or the person that you're praying for is too far gone for God to act. That's what you're saying. Think about that for a minute, Christians. If God is all-powerful, 
If Jesus is who he says he is, he died, he rose again, he sent his Holy Spirit, there is no situation where God cannot act. None. None. And we must pray like it. <coughs> we must learn to pray with passion like it. Someone said, uh, I remember how he did it, how he said it once. I don't even remember who it was. I remember it was a guy, though. And he said, uh, he said, the louder the voice of doubt gets in my head, he said, the louder the voice of my prayers get. He goes, I ain't going to let that voice get louder than the one of mine praying to my God. I mean, the Greek word here, ektenos. Say that three times five. Ektenos. It, it literally, it means a high intensity prayer. It's actually the same word Luke used in the Gospel of Luke for when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed so hard that he was sweating blood. And I know for some, I've met some people, they're like, oh, I pray, I just don't have that kind of passion. Look, I'm not trying to say to muster up some special passion because you have to be so passionate God can hear you. We're not getting mixed up in that, that false teaching because that's out there. But if you feel like, man, these things never come to my mind or I don't feel passionate for them, here's a great thing to do. If we believe in the power of prayer, ask God for that kind of heart. Say, God, put on my mind the people that need to be prayed for. Lord, give me passion for those prayers. Burn a fire inside of me, a desire inside of me for me to lift them up in prayer that I may be able to play a role in you touching their lives. Ask God for that kind of passion. Are you with me, church? Look, I'm, I'm not preaching these things just for the sake of preaching. This, these will literally change your life if you apply them and take them to heart. Now, I know I said finally once, but this is the real finally. Because I, I get this question whenever I talk about the power of prayer. I want to be clear, just because you pray passionately, you pray boldly, you, you're in faith, you are faithed up, you got your like faith t-shirt, you're like all good to go, right? It doesn't mean that God's going to answer your prayers the way that you want him to. I mean, Luke doesn't say it, but I'm going to bet that there were people praying for James who got by the sword as they were paying for Peter. So why is James allowed to die and Peter's like rescued by an angel in like the coolest way? All, both were dedicated servants to God. They were both needed by the church. The only answer to something like this is the sovereign will of God. James said, Jesus said this to James back in Mark 10. He says, the cup that I drink, you're going to drink also. They were referring to his death. God had a purpose in James dying right then and there. His number was up. His number was up. And that's where it goes in trusting the will of God. Even when we see things and we're like, this does not make sense. This cannot be. God got this one wrong. We have to choose. Okay, am I going to trust in my limited view and what I can see, and what I think is right by my 20, 30, 40, 60, 70 years on this world, or am I going to trust in the all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful God who I've seen all throughout the Bible take bad things and make great things out of them? Now, to some of you that are new to the Bible, you might think, well, this is kind of cruel. Allow your people to suffer. What kind of loving God would do that? Fair question. But the followers of Jesus, they didn't seem to take this view. James said this, the brother, the brother of Jesus, he said, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to him. Peter, same Peter here, one who tradition says was died being hung upside down. He says, After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will restore himself. Restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Paul, in Romans, also, tradition says, died for his faith. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. You see, it's all about perspective. 
I always, this is my favorite illustration to use for this. When you're a little kid, like little Ella, my little two-year-old, right? If she fall down and hits her knee or gets a scrape or a bump, she is in tears. Her world is just, it's just, a, you've, it's a mess, right? When you were a little kid and you got hurt, you're just, right? But unless you have an emotionally unstable parent, which happens, the parent's not like, ah. The parent picks up the child, holds the child, says, it's going to be okay. It's going to comfort. Why? The parent has a perspective that the child doesn't. The pain's going to stop. It's going to go away. They're going to be healed. And in the same way, our time on earth is like that compared to eternity. And so God knows and the believers knew that they're suffering, though it's very real and present in the moment and very horrible for some beyond words that I could even describe very well to fully bring it, how horrible it was across. They knew it was that compared to eternity. And so that if they could suffer for that to help bring the message of the gospel that people may experience the redeem, redemption of the gospel for their sins for eternity, they're like, sign me up. As Paul said also in Corinthians, he, wrote, he put it well, he says, he goes for this light and momentary affliction, he said, it's preparing us all an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And he goes on to say, for we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. So church, you have a call to spread the gospel using the personality and the words that God gave you just as the first century. Sometimes that's going to bite you in the, the backhand. You're going to get punished for it. But you keep pressing with the gospel anyway. In the end, you'll get the win with Jesus. Only It's only those who oppose God that lose. You keep pressing for the gospel. You keep praying and encouraging your brothers and sisters around you it could be fellow students that are in school. It could be family members who are going through hard times and being facing some kind of persecution for their faith, even within their family. And you're lifting them up in prayers. And you're lifting up those across the world in prayers as they come to your mind, for, you know, hoping that your prayers can be a part of their story. And ultimately, trusting in the sovereign of God, knowing that nobody can thwart his gospel. The devil tried all through the Old Testament he tried at the birth of Jesus. He tried through the New Testament. He's still trying now, and yet the church keeps flourishing. Our call is to be faithful. Amen?